In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today, although we are surrounded by ease and money and many things which make life very convenient, we live nonetheless in a world that is quite miserable. And the reason that it is miserable is that it has divorced itself from the truth. Even natural truths, truths that we take for granted, basic truths of morality, basic decency. And through the same principles that have corrupted this decency, we have seen our faith corrupted in almost everyone whom we know. We see a false faith in the churches that we once attended. That world of the truth of Catholicism has fallen apart for us. The Catholic Church in ages past being the bastion of unchanging truth. And now it's reduced to a very small number. And the reason for this misery that we live in is the relativism and subjectivism that infects people's minds today. And I will explain. Relativism is to say that there is no objective norm of truth, but instead that all truth is relative to the person who is thinking it or embracing it. This relativism invades law and religion. It decrees that there are no objective moral norms upon which laws should be based. It decrees that there are no absolute or unchanging dogmas to which all are bound to adhere. And there is likewise no unchanging moral code, no natural law. Anything that is considered to be wrong today could be considered right tomorrow. And so we see in our society, one by one, states caving in to sodomitic marriage. And there is no argument against it because of relativism, because the population is infected by this relativism that there is no objective moral code. It's all what you feel, what you want to do. Subjectivism is the foundation of this relativism, for it holds that truth is not the conformity of our minds to a, an object that is outside of the mind. That's the traditional definition of truth. But instead, it is the conformity of our mind to our internal ways of organizing our experiences. This is the modern philosophy. Therefore, just as everyone has a different internal way of experiencing things, so truth may vary from person to person, all the while remaining true. So something can be true for you, but not true for me. It is to think and act in accordance with your own personal experiences and perceptions. So if somebody says, unnatural vice is something true for me, or cohabitation or adultery is something true for me, I feel this is right. Under these principles, there's nothing to say in return. There is no moral code to impose upon those persons. And little by little, morality completely falls apart and we live in a world of unnatural vice, and we are sickened by it. 
there is something deeply wrong in this society, something perverse and weird. And that makes us miserable. Relativism and subjectivism lead to certain modern virtues, so-called. The first of these is the virtue of liberalism which is the modern virtue, in quotation marks, which inclines us to approve of and applaud any system or doctrine which dissolves the objective norm of belief or of the moral law. Anything at all, if it breaks down the old walls of morality and belief, then it's good. primary tenet of liberalism is that the highest good of man is his liberty, and consequently the exercise of his liberty is what should be always favored. Law should merely prevent people from physically harming one another, but everything else, including pornography, ought to be permitted. Even the definition of harm to another, physical harm to another, can change according to the rules of subjectivism. Look at abortion and euthanasia. What was considered to be murder in the 1960s, abortion, for which you could go to jail if you were a doctor that committed one, is now the norm. Why? Because if it's in your womb, you can't see it, you have no experience of it, and therefore it doesn't exist for you, and it's not a human being. And euthanasia, if you're no longer useful, if you can no longer interact and smile and so forth, you should get an injection and there will be a funeral. Things change in that system. When the flag of liberalism, excuse me, under the flag of liberalism come the following things, divorce and remarriage, cohabitation, fornication, adultery, sodomy, and sodomite marriages, pornography, socialism, communism, big government, oppressive taxation, manipulation of money by small groups, the spread of false ideas, religious liberty, separation of church and state, secularism, and democracy in the bad sense. The church is indifferent to democracy if it merely means that people vote for their candidates and their presidents. But it condemns democracy in this sense if it means that power rests with the people and that all power comes from the people. For the church teaches from St. Paul that all power comes from God. And we must add to this list the false freedom of the press. That is, its freedom to print whatever it wants, even blasphemies against God and the Blessed Virgin Mary, and freedom of speech considered falsely, that you have the right to say whatever you want, That all comes from the the virtue of liberalism. Then there is the virtue of tolerance, so-called. This virtue inclines a person to accept, at the very least in the practical order, some thought or activity which he does not agree with. It does not matter how evil or depraved something may be in your consideration. It should always be tolerated. 
Hence, we hear people say, well, I would never do it, but I would not object if other people did it. And tolerance is seen as a virtue, that is, it is always good to tolerate, no matter what it is, tolerate it. And its opposite, intolerance, is considered to be a vice. That if you are ever intolerant, you're evil and you're wrong. That is the modern mentality. You're judgmental, as they say. Then there is the virtue of pluralism. This so-called virtue inclines us to see as a great good the mixture of various contradictory thoughts, attitudes, and moral activity in any given situation or society. And we should add to that religion. We hear of a pluralistic society as something praiseworthy and good where there is no law that requires us to worship God in a certain way or requires us to obey the natural law. That it is good that there is a big mix in all of these things that pertain to the nature of man and his happiness and his eternal salvation. Therefore, according to pluralism, the coexistence in the same institution of many and contradictory points of view is considered a good and healthy thing. Such societies, such pluralistic societies, have their liberals and their conservatives. Both sides believe in pluralism. Both sides believe that the opposite has some validity. And both sides believe that the other side has a right to express its view, no matter if it contradicts what you think or say. That's liberalism and pluralism. In such a system, the conservative merely serves as an agent to slow down the advance of liberalism. The persons who are in control in such a system are the liberals because they have all of the principles with them. And the conservatives are just slow liberals. They think that the liberals are going too fast. It's like a train with a caboose. Most of you are old enough to remember cabooses. That was always the last car on the freight train. The locomotive is the liberal. He goes over the track first. And then there is the long freight train. And the caboose eventually follows and runs over the track. The same track. And so the conservative eventually caves in to all of the liberal agenda but feels that he must put a certain break upon it. Then there is the virtue of ecumenism, which is to apply the principles of relativism and subjectivism to religious dogma. Ecumenism is the enemy of dogma. The only dogma in ecumenism is that there is no dogma. It is pluralism in religion. And pluralism and religion are two things which are absolutely opposed because God is absolutely unchanging. And therefore, religion must be absolutely unchanging because it is a description of God. The dogmas that we believe are true descriptions of God. And they cannot change. And this ecumenism is the cause of all of the changes of Vatican II. And we have seen all of these other isms that I explained today recently in the document that came out of the Synod that we should be welcoming to the Sodomites. 
They have a lot of gifts to give us. And we should be welcoming to the cohabitators, the fornicators, and the adulterers, and that they should be able to receive communion. It has infected everything, and it makes us miserable because our highest faculty is our intellect. And even if we should be surrounded with all the conveniences of life, when we see this contradiction of obvious truth and of the truths of our faith in the world, we become miserable because it is to face 24 hours a day a sick and weird, twisted world. And we hate to live in it. And we long for the courts of God in which there is order and beauty and perfection and law. And so Pius XI, seeing all of this coming, established this holy feast as a response to all of this. Our Lord, when asked if he is a king, he said, yes, I am a king. And for this came I into the world to witness unto the truth. And those who are of the truth hear my voice. Therefore, linking his royalty to the truth, the purpose of his coming and the purpose of his being the king is to witness unto the truth. Now, beware of the tremendous power of culture. I'm sure as Catholics, you believe and understand all of the things that I explained to you today. But when you go out into the world outside of these four walls, you bump into a very strong culture that is completely imbued with all of these things that I just described. And people require you practically to consent to things that you should not consent to and to live according to these corrupt principles. Culture has an enormous effect upon us. We breathe it every day, and we must resist all of the temptation of culture to become liberals and pluralists. Our culture must be Catholic, which is 100% anti-liberal, 100% anti-relativist, 100% anti-subjectivist, 100% anti-pluralist, and 100% anti-ecumenical. That is our culture, and it must be preserved. Pope Leo XIII said, the end of the 19th century, the security of the state demands that we should be brought back to him from whom we ought never to have departed, to him who is the way, the truth, and the life, not for individuals merely, but for human society through its whole extent. Christ our Lord must be reinstated as the ruler of human society. It belongs to him as do all its members. All the elements of the commonwealth Legal commands and prohibitions, popular institutions, schools, marriage, home life, the workshop, and the palace, meaning the government, all must be made to come to that fountain and imbibe that life that comes from him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.